Thank you for joining us for some of the best stories from the KPBS newsroom this week. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Coming up, child care for local military families can include long wait lists. See what's happening at Miramar to improve the situation. KPBS investigates credit unions and the overdraft fees imposed on customers. See where some of our local chains rank when it comes to the millions of dollars collected statewide. And climate change is on the agenda at the annual United Nations Conference. Hear from some of the San Diegans who are taking part. And we're approaching the end of another year and another record for injuries due to falls from the border wall. And with the wall nearly twice as tall as it used to be, the injuries keep getting worse. KPBS border reporter Gustavo Solis talked to doctors who say the wall is creating a public health crisis. When Dr. Alexander Tenorio began his residency program at UC San Diego Health, he didn't expect to see a lot of migrants and asylum seekers. After all, he specializes in brain surgery. But then he covered a couple of shifts in the trauma unit. And I started noticing all these uh, brain and spinal cord injuries from migrants um, coming in. And the reason it stuck with me is because my parents, you know, they're, they're uh, immigrants, they cross the same border. So it was very personal to me. So I started just looking into it. These patients had something else in common. All of them had fallen from the San Diego section of the border wall. Tenorio saw broken backs, collapsed lungs, and severe brain trauma. Once you get above 10 feet, that's when you start seeing these injuries that look like high, high, high energy uh, uh, car accidents. UC San Diego Health is on pace to receive more than 360 border wall related hospital admissions in 2023, a new record. In fact, the hospital has seen a record number of border patients every year since 2019. That's when the Trump administration increased the border wall height from 17 feet to 30 feet. And the numbers just keep going up. So in, in 2018, um, you know, only less than a dozen patients falling off the wall with serious injuries. And um, now it's, you know, 340 or plus a year or uh, at least two a day. Dr. Jay Doucette is head of the trauma unit at UC San Diego Medical Health Center in Hillcrest. He's been on the front lines of this epidemic since the beginning. Before, we know, we might see a foot fracture or, or leg fracture. Now we're seeing everything. Severe brain injuries, um, crushed chests, um, pelvic fractures. Records also show that more women are being hospitalized from border falls. In 2019, less than a quarter of admissions were women. So far in 2023, almost half of fall patients have been women, including more than 20 who were pregnant. This impacts the entire hospital system. Median cost per patient is almost $300,000. The vast majority of those costs are paid for by taxpayers, mostly through the state's Medi-Cal system. These cases also required highly trained specialists who are already overburdened with patients. Doucette says people needing spinal surgery are particularly impacted. There are very few spine surgeons uh, available in San Diego. And the waiting time for all patients, not just border fall patients, but for anybody in San Diego who has a spine fracture, they're now waiting twice as long as the national average to get their fractures fixed. Both doctors Tenorio and Doucette have been sounding the alarm, trying to get people in positions of power to recognize this as a public health crisis. Tenorio was even an expert witness for Congress at a Homeland Security Committee hearing in July. Ultimately, these raised border walls have resulted in a record number of traumatic injuries, increased severity and mortality, and increased economic burden to our hospital systems. Doucette has spoken with elected officials at all levels of government. They're all very concerned, um, and but unfortunately, nobody seems to have any answers to it. He says today's political climate plays a significant role. It's obvious when talking to representatives, it's a radioactive issue. Nobody wants to talk about the wall. You know, the, the increase in injuries has occurred through two different administrations and neither of them want to talk about this. Both doctors plan to continue researching the issue and advocating for solutions. They're already collaborating with trauma doctors in Texas and Arizona to get an idea of just how widespread this problem is. Gustavo Solis, KPBS News. And Gustavo Solis is also one of our guests on KPBS Roundtable. This week's episode focuses on news from the border. You can stream it anytime at kpbs.org and wherever you get your podcasts.
A deadly section of West Point Loma Boulevard in San Diego was due to get a protected bike lane this year, but bike advocates say those plans fell apart due to state regulators. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen has the story. People here want to be able to walk and bike to be able to safely cross the street. I meet Stefan Vance on West Point Loma Boulevard. Cars are speeding by, many of them well above the speed limit of 40 miles per hour. Years ago, local residents and city officials agreed this road needs protected bike lanes. The plan was for a so-called road diet, putting bike lanes by the curb, using street parking as protection, and removing one lane of travel in each direction. That would discourage speeding and shorten the crossing distance for pedestrians. The problem? West Point Loma Boulevard is near the coast and falls under the jurisdiction of the California Coastal Commission. The state agency is tasked with maintaining coastal access. They told city officials if they want to reduce the number of lanes, even to improve safety, they'd have to analyze the traffic impacts first and amend their local coastal program. Resurfacing and restriping is a pretty simple thing for the city to do, but when you start throwing in those other kind of bureaucratic processes, then it becomes a whole nother ball game and it makes it more difficult for the city to do projects like this. The city didn't budget the time or money to jump through all those hoops, so it recently restriped the road to its original design with no bike lanes. Just one month ago, a woman was biking here when a driver struck her from behind, right where the new bike lanes would have been installed. She was hospitalized with a broken pelvis. Vance says the Coastal Commission is putting bureaucracy ahead of common sense. Let's be reasonable about what we do to preserve coastal access and at the same time protect safety of people traveling regardless of how they're going about town. The Coastal Commission sent KPBS a statement blaming the city for not acting sooner. It said, quote, the commission strongly supports bike lanes as an important form of public access. We're still committed to expediting this project and working with the city to get it approved quickly and consistent with the law. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. Child care is among the largest expenses faced by working families. Pandemic-related strain on the child care labor force led to long wait lists at military facilities across the country. But as KPBS military reporter Andrew Dyer explains, the Navy says things are improving here in San Diego. This brand new center just opened in October. It's high tech and secure. A wall of monitors in the lobby show live video from each of the building's classrooms. Parents can drop in any time and see their children, and front desk staff can see what's going on. All of its classrooms open to outdoor, age-appropriate playgrounds. Most are empty now, but Janet Hooten, who manages child and youth programs for the Navy throughout the Southwest, says once the center is fully staffed, there's room for more than 300 children, space that's desperately needed. Our wait list is about 500 children for just Miramar. But Metro San Diego, we have about 2,600 children on the wait list, and about 1,100 of those are under the age of 12 months. Those numbers are significantly better than they were during the summer of 2022 when there were more than 4,000 military kids on the San Diego wait list. Spots for infants are the most difficult to fill because of the smaller child-to-provider ratio requirements. In addition to building new centers, Hooten says better pay and bonuses help with staffing. We are in the process of working with our colleges that have the early childhood department, and so uh, looking at internship and bringing them on board as well. The Navy also holds hiring and recruitment fairs for child care workers, and she says pay rates are rising well above minimum wage. Some of the other uh, regions were a little bit harder hit, but for us, when it hit $15, we were already paying over that. Uh, now it's going up, I think, in January, if I'm not mistaken, to 16. Minimum wage is going to $16 an hour. Um, and so with that, we're already paying above that. Democrat Sarah Jacobs represents California's 51st Congressional District and sits on the House Armed Services Committee. Miramar is part of her district, as are thousands of service members living in central and eastern San Diego County. She says taking care of military families at home should be a top Pentagon priority. The number one thing that I hear from military families in my town halls with them and conversation is really about quality of life issues, predominantly housing and child care. Jacobs points to several amendments in next year's defense bill she says will do even more to address child care, including better pay and benefits for workers and a boost in the child care subsidy service members receive. And then also on the family side, uh, increasing transparency 
testing accuracy of the wait lists um, so that they understand, uh, you know, how long they have to wait. Another complication is how the DOD manages child care workers, Hooten says. Each branch of service has their own administrative system. That means when spouses relocate to a base run by a different branch, the job doesn't move with them. So OSD is really looking hard at that, um, it, but it's, it's all about their retirement um, and how would that transfer over. It's a little bit more work when you have two different uh, retirement systems, but they are working hard on that, especially uh, locations like this. The new Miramar Center is the first of three facility projects in San Diego. Another center at Miramar is being updated, and the Navy's building another brand new center at Naval Base Point Loma. Andrew Dyer, KPBS News. Not-for-profit credit unions have long billed themselves as community-based alternatives to big commercial banks. Yet KPBS investigative reporter Scott Rod found that when it comes to charging overdraft fees, they have similar practices. That's my money. That's my food budget for a whole week. Tony Brumfeld has used credit unions most of his adult life. He appreciates their customer service and connection to the community. So he was surprised when I told him credit unions chartered in California collected over $250 million last year in overdraft fees. Do you think of them as being a local, a local service to the community? You know, and they're not supposed to be in this for making the big buck. They're supposed to just be making ends of meat like the rest of us. Customers are hit with an overdraft fee when they make a purchase and their checking account doesn't have enough money to cover it. Consumer advocates, fiscal watchdogs, and even members of Congress have heavily criticized big commercial banks for the billions they collect in overdraft fees. And turns out it's big business for credit unions too. Last year, credit unions chartered in California brought in a quarter billion dollars in revenue through overdraft penalties, according to a KPBS analysis of data collected by the state. Regulators should treat overdraft as the five alarm fire that it has burning through low income communities and families living paycheck to paycheck. Aaron Klein is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, a D.C. based think tank. He says overdraft fees are nearly pure profit for financial institutions and disproportionately impact customers living paycheck to paycheck. For years, big banks have had to disclose revenue from overdraft fees. But Klein says credit unions, which are technically not-for-profit businesses, have avoided this requirement. Credit unions have largely escaped scrutiny on overdraft by a combination of wrapping themselves in the good guy flag as a nonprofit, mission-oriented entity and by not releasing data to the public. That is until this year in California, after lawmakers passed the first law in the country requiring the disclosure of overdraft fee revenue from state chartered financial institutions. San Diego County Credit Union ranked second highest among the state's 100 plus credit unions, collecting $18 million in overdraft fees last year. That's surprising for a credit union that has long marketed itself as the anti-big bank. For years, the credit union ran a series of ads hammering greedy banks and their excessive fees. Hi, I'd like to open a checking account. My name? The bankers in the ads could only say one word. Right? Money, money, money. The campaign underscores its money. message in the end. Money? We're nothing like a big bank. We're better. San Diego County Credit Union declined an interview request and did not respond to multiple follow-up inquiries. Other, smaller credit unions collected less in overdraft fees, but that revenue made up a substantial portion of their income. Consider Oceanside-based Front Wave Credit Union. They collected nearly $8 million in overdraft fees last year. That amounted to 12% of the company's overall income and 140% of its net income. In other words, Front Wave easily could have lost money last year without revenue from overdraft fees. We call it a service. We don't call it a fee. Bill Bernie is the CEO of Front Wave. He says many Front Wave members rely on overdrafts at the end of the month as a bridge before their next payday. The credit union has rebranded it as courtesy pay. Front Wave charges $20 per overdraft, up to five times a day for each negative balance purchase. That means a FrontWave customer could be hit with $100 in fees in one day. So it, it is an important source of income to us. I just don't think we do it in a predatory way. Consumer watchdogs aren't buying this argument. Kiara O'Laughlin is a researcher and policy advocate at the San Diego-based Center on Policy Initiatives. 
She says overdraft fees are inherently onerous, even if they're rebranded to sound like a benefit. I'd say any, any business or organization that's profiting off of exploiting other folks' vulnerabilities is not helping people, it's hurting people. The scrutiny on big banks has made a difference. In the last few years, they've reformed their overdraft fee policies. Some allow repayment grace periods, while others have done away with the fees altogether. It's unclear if credit unions plan to do the same anytime soon. Scott Rod, KPBS News. And this is a two-part story. Scott Rod also found credit unions in San Diego County have boosted CEO pay while charging their members millions in overdraft fees. We have that part of the story on our website, kpbs.org. And that story was one of our most popular this week at kpbs.org. Here are some of the others. Eric Anderson is covering the latest impact on the solar industry as California updates its rules. A new report shows the real cost of living in San Diego and Imperial counties, and the San Diego Public Library also offers banned books to people across the country. A canoe that has sailed around the world is docked in San Diego. KPBS reporter Katie Heisen climbed aboard to learn how the crew is taking back the ancient Polynesian voyaging tradition. Hidden behind ships at the Maritime Museum is a small double canoe lashed together with six miles of cords, the Hokulea. It's modeled after ancient Polynesian vessels. When we were young, there were not, no canoes like this. They were just stories. So you took the out. That's Captain Bruce Blankenfeld. Voila. He sailed the boat for over 40 years. All of this was created at a time in Hawaii when uh, the culture, the Hawaiian culture, was still at a low point. You know, had it been the Hawaiian culture had just been um, relegated to a past tense. It was brought out of history books and back onto waves during what became known as the Hawaiian Renaissance in the 1970s. Voyaging again became a way of recapturing a tradition erased by colonizers. When all of us who are, had been um, educated in a Western uh, model had thought about learning 200 stars and guiding a canoe across you know, a vast expanse of 2,500 miles, guided by the stars, ocean swells, seabirds, everything like that. I mean, you know, we basically looked at each other and said, yeah, I don't think so, you know? It was like something in our minds so impossible. But 200,000 miles later, they're still going. The crew navigates using the same methods as their ancestors, who crossed the ocean centuries before Columbus. San Diego is their last stop before returning to show aloha to those still recovering from the fires in Maui. Katie Heisen, KPBS News. The United Nations Climate Conference called COP28 is underway in Dubai. San Diego Scripps Institution of Oceanography is there. KPBS SciTech reporter Thomas Fudge says they want to highlight the ocean's role in climate change and introduce the next generation of climate scientists. Our people the world, the planet, needs our actions now. The UN Climate Conference is a global meeting of politicians and scientists that has a strong bearing on the fight against global warming. It's where the Paris Agreement was adopted in 2015. This year, Scripps Oceanography will co-host the Ocean Pavilion at the conference to show the huge role the ocean plays in the battle over rising temperatures. Treating the ocean as being as important as the land is, is really, really important. It is the, the base of the ecosystem. Professor Lynn Talley will be attending her second UN climate conference. She points out the ocean absorbs 90 percent of the extra heat generated by global warming and 30 percent of the excess carbon dioxide. But the ocean provides a huge service in absorbing so much heat and so much of the excess carbon dioxide, but those have very negative impacts on the ocean um, ecosystems. And so we can't just rely on the ocean to take care of the problem. 
UC San Diego has a total delegation of 30 people attending COP28, and the people going to Dubai won't just be faculty members. Mitchell Chandler is a Ph.D. candidate at Scripps Oceanography. He comes from New Zealand, where he says the warming of the ocean is causing marine heat waves. Which then influences like land terrestrial heat waves. You can have more extreme temperature or drought or even like we've recently had some tropical storms or like hurricanes that have extended out of the tropics and caused a lot of damage to the North Island of New Zealand. Chandler studies ocean currents at Scripps Oceanography. He says he's excited to meet with policymakers to talk about how global warming is affecting island nations like his. He says previous generations have been too slow to act. It's definitely frustrating seeing how slow and resistant to change a lot of um, people, places, companies, countries are, but there's also optimism there, right? He says today there is a global will to make changes. Tally agrees. I'm feeling energized to go to this meeting and um, because there's so much bubbling about finally, about uh, finally recognizing in a broad sense that climate change is here. COP28, the UN Climate Conference, runs from November 30th to December 12th in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. Thomas Fudge, KPBS News. An exhibit documenting the history of Filipinos and Filipino Americans in the South Bay has been extended for another year. KPBS South Bay reporter Corey Suzuki says the exhibit shines a light on the deep legacy of San Diego's Filipino community. The exhibit is tucked away in the back corner of Chula Vista's Central Library. When you step inside, you're immediately transported across time. Old newspaper clippings and family photographs make up the Filipinos of South Bay exhibit, which tells the sweeping story of the Filipino diaspora. Uh, What became those pillars that brought the community together? And those were the organizations um, from the various regions, uh, from the various causes, like the most important one is the veterans and then um, how uh, the beauty pageants had helped with building community and, of course, Philippine dance and music bringing um, and elevating the Philippine uh, presence in, in, the, in the South Bay. And then finally, of course, their integration into the Catholic Church. For historian Judy Patoxel, one of her favorite stories is of the Manang, or elder brother generation, the very first Filipino immigrants to arrive on the West Coast. That story is, is I think, one of my favorites because it, it involves my family. My father came in the light, late 1920s. He came to come to school, though, not, not so much, but he, had to be in, he, he did become a laborer as well because the reality of, of discrimination and, and um, the Great Depression um, so, but when World War II, he joined the U.S. Army, and then that's how he went back to the Philippines, met my mom, and, and brought her. The exhibit also shows a range of other stories, from flags that Filipino organizers carried alongside Cesar Chavez, to photos of a tiny Imperial Beach barber shop that, in the evenings, would transform into a dance studio. Organizers say they are fighting to get this history the recognition it deserves. Even though the Filipino community is the largest Asian American group in San Diego and the second largest in California. Even though we have been the largest Asian American ethnic group, our stories have not been told. And so for this to come to fruition and having our stories told and having media cover it, having us be in a museum, it really makes, I think, a really big difference. Now, all of those stories will live on at the library for another year. Kori Suzuki, KPBS News. Tibetan monks from the Gadanshatsa Monastery in southern India are in the North County this week to spread their message of peace, compassion, and love. KPBS North County reporter Alexander Wynn says while here, they are also creating sacred sand mandalas to remind us of the impermanent nature of everything. With each careful tap of a specialized cone, Sandmaster Geshe Legden Gompel expertly places the sand onto the design of the mandala. It's a representation of the palace of a deity in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. This one represents the palace of the Buddha Maitreya. Mandala means that which extracts the essence. We are taking the, the blessing of s- someone who is a luminous form and uh, by really 
uh, you know, engaging on that by initiating on that deity and having the uh, benefit as a uh, blessings uh, to back to us. Geishi Tenzin Lekse is the spokesperson for the Sacred Arts of Tibet Tour. He says by going through the hard work and training to create the mandalas, the monks learned patience and the peace and happiness that comes from it. We are accumulating the merit, the virtues, the wholesome merit by really having a deep concentration on, from your mind. It was a special treat for the students at Village Gates Children's Academy to see the mandala being made at the Seaside Center for Spiritual Living in Encinitas. For seventh grader Leonardo Lee, seeing it gave him a sense of calm. I just felt kind of like peaceful, like the silence. It was, it felt good. It was very interesting of like, not just thinking of it from like one standpoint and how there was much more meaning than just like what meets the eye. Each color and each grain of sand on this mandala have a special meaning. And when it's all completed, it will be dissolved, signifying the impermanence of everything. For Gary Elliott, it was not the first time he was exposed to the mandala, but this time the concept of impermanence struck a chord with him. And in just a few days, they'll finish constructing this beautiful illustration like our own biosphere, it's going to, it's, it, it's going to be swept away and dissolved in the ocean. And I'm thinking, what a real-time uh, teaching. It has a lot of levels to it. Especially with the impact climate change is having on the environment, he says. The monks will continue to work on the mandala at the Seaside Center until Sunday, when it will be swept away, reminding us that everything in the universe will eventually be swept away by the sands of time. Alexander Nguyen, KPPS News. And after their stay at Seaside Center, the monks will head to the California Center for the Performing Arts in Escondido, in Escondido to create another mandala there. And we hope that you enjoyed this look at KPBS News this week. I'm Maya Travolsi. Thanks for joining us.